This is an audio sermon recorded at the Church of Christ at Johnson Mill in Fayetteville, Arkansas. We are Christians seeking to worship God in spirit and in truth according to the New Testament. Come worship with us Sunday mornings at 1030 at 3801 Johnson Mill Boulevard. 1 Peter 2 and 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, when, when this writing here in Peter, he's talking to the church, he's talking to Christians, look at how he describes us Christians. We're a chosen generation. When you look at the word church, the ecclesia, that, that Greek word, it means called out. We're called out of the world into this chosen generation. We're also a royal priesthood. You can look back in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament it talks a lot about the Levitical priesthood, the Levites, out of the tribes of Israel, those are the priests. Well, now we are that royal priesthood. Now, when you think about that, a royal priesthood, you have royalty, like kingdom and princes and all those kind of things, and then you have priesthood. Usually those two are two different things. But what God does and what Christ does is he lumps those things together. We're both princes and we're heirs and heirs according to Christ and joint heirs with him. And then we're also that priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, like it talks about in the Old Testament. We're also a holy nation, a peculiar people. We should be different from the world. And then it tells us, after it gives us all these definitions, it describes us as Christians, it says that you should show forth the praises of him, God, who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now let's look at verse 12. Verse 12, it says, Having your conversations honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So as you continue on in 1 Peter 2, it tells us that we should be walking honestly among the world. When it talks about the Gentiles here, it's talking about those who are not of the people of God, that we should be walking honestly among them so that they will see our good works, and when they do see those good works, that they glorify God. When we do that, the, the glory is all supposed to go to God, not to us, so that they will see Him. Now in verse 15, it says, For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So when we look at that, we look at us Christians that we're called out of the world. We're that royal priesthood, the chosen generation. We're the ones that, that Christ has told us we should be different. We should show forth those good works so that God will be glorified in the day of visitation. So as Christians and the church, we're called out of this sin and darkness. We're called out of the world, and we should live the lives that reflect such. We're no longer in that, that sin. So I want to look at a really good example that we have, and that's with Paul. If you remember a little bit about Paul, before he was named Paul, he was actually named Saul. Now Saul, in the Jews' religion, he was, was really high up in the Jews' religion, so much that he was persecuting the church. And Paul tells us this in the book of Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13 says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. And this is Paul writing about himself, and he was saying that before he was converted, before he was a Christian, that he was actually a persecutor of the church. Now, a lot of us, we remember that, that he was going around and he was killing Christians, and like remember when Stephen was stoned to death and he was over in the, the side and he was holding the men's cloaks when Stephen got stoned, he participated in that. He helped. He was in the, persecuting the church and wasted it. And it says that he profited in the Jews' religion. He was really high up in the Jewish religion. He thought what he was doing was right, but we obviously know that that was not right. And now he knows that that was not right, that he was going. It says he was above many his equals in his own nation. He was exceedingly zealous of the traditions of his fathers. He was following after that Jewish religion. He was very zealous in doing so. So before he was a Christian, he was zealously persecuting Christians. He was killing them and persecuting the church. Now let's go in uh, verse 15 and 16. It says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, and immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. So we remember the conversion of Paul, that when he was on the road to Damascus and then... Uh, Christ came to him, and he, he had the scales over his eyes, and he was blinded, and then he was told to go and see this man named Ananias, and that he was going to be converted that way. And Ananias told him to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins. When that happened, Paul says that immediately 
He conferred not with flesh and blood, but instead he revealed Christ in his life. So he was just persecuting the church. He was a killer of the Christians. And then when he was converted to be a Christian, now he used all that zeal and all that zealousness that he had from the Jewish religion. Now he was going to use that for the Christianity and go after him so that, that Christ would be revealed in him. So just as Paul was called to do this, just as Christ told, told Paul to go reveal him in, in Paul's life, he tells us to do the same thing today. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, says, For ye were sometimes in darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Every single one of us, before we became Christians, we were walking in darkness. We had sin in our life. We were a part of the world. We were worldly creatures. And we were always there when, when we had that. But when we became a Christian, it says, Now we are light in the Lord. And since we're light in the Lord, we have called, been called out of that darkness and out of that worldly state. Now we are to walk as children of the light, just as Paul did. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We think about that. Think about all the way back in creation, that when God spoke the light into the existence, he said, and let there be light, and there was light. He spoke that light and commanded the light to shine in darkness. It's that same God that has commanded you and I today to shine the lights out of our hearts to the world, and that we could show the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ through our life and through our actions. This is not just something that's good to do. This is a commandment from God, that same commandment that spoke the world and everything into to existence. So when we look at that, we look at that Paul was converted to Christianity, and he started revealing Christ in his life immediately. It says immediately he converted not with flesh and blood. And just as he did so, we should be doing so as well. That when we're converted to Christianity and we become a disciple of Christ, that we should shine that light through our life in all things. So the second thing I want to look at is why should we be a representative of Christ? Why should we shine that glory through our life? You know, if you think about that, People can't physically see Christ today, can we? You can't go around the corner and you can't look up and physically see Jesus Christ. But you can see him through other people's actions, can't you? When we think about that, I want you to think about a workplace. Let's just use the workplace of Chick-fil-A, for example. A lot of us go to Chick-fil-A to eat. We like the place. But one thing that, that a lot of people really like Chick-fil-A, regardless of what you think about their food, is they have excellent customer service. Their customer service is top-notch. So when we think about that, you think about going to Chick-fil-A and you order and you meet the people and they're very friendly, they're very nice to you, they always make sure your order is right. They, they seem like they really care about you and your family and your order. And by those actions, by that good customer service from the, the employee that works there, we now say Chick-fil-A is a really good company. Now, we don't really know that Chick-fil-A is a good company, but the, the customer service that they represent shows them to be a good company, don't they? Well, it's the same thing with Christianity that we have today. When you think about Christians, when we show forth the glory and that customer service, so to speak, we show forth the good works out of our lives, they can see that Christ is a good Savior for them as well by our actions and our Christianity. So when we think about that, let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. It says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's the point in verse 16. Let your light so shine before men. Shine your light so they see your good works. They see you being a good Christian and a good disciple of Christ, and so they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. The purpose is so that God will be glorified. And we do that by shining forth the light in our life. You know, our actions should attract people like a light to Jesus. I want you to think about that. Have you ever been out in a really dark place? Let's say you're way out in the country and there's nothing really much around, and it's just super, super dark. And all of a sudden, and far off in the distance, you see a light. What happens when you see that light? Your eyes automatically go to it, don't it? You're automatically looking at that light. And then the second thing that it does is it's going to raise curiosity. What is that? It's super dark, and you see this one little tiny light way out in the distance. Your eye catches it, and then you wonder, what is that light? It raises curiosity. Christians do the same thing in this dark world today. 
You have the world full of darkness, full of hate, full of sin, full of envy, all these things, and then you have the good Christians shining forth the light out of their life. The first thing that it's going to do is it's going to get noticed. That the people in the world are going to look at that Christian and say, what is that? Why is he doing that? Why is he acting that way? And then it's going to raise the curiosity of what's going on with this guy. He's different, right? So that's why when we think about shining our light, that we're called to shine it out so that other people can see it. Don't hide it away, but shine your good work so that the, the glory of God will be revealed. In John chapter 8, verse 12, it says, Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of the life. If you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you shouldn't walk in darkness, but Jesus as the pure and perfect light of, the, of everything should be shining through your, your hearts, and other people will be able to see that. If you're a true disciple of Christ, if you're following after him, you will be shining forth the light in your, in your life. So just as, as Christ is that pure light that shines through us, we should be shining that light for other people to see as well. You know, God has this purpose in our life to be that shining instrument for His kingdom and for His glory so that others will be attracted to Him. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. And Paul writing here, he says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus and the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Look at what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying in verse 5, it says, For we preach not ourselves. It's not my words that I preach. It's not the things that I want to tell you. But we preach Jesus Christ. We preach His gospel. We preach His life. And we also make ourselves servants for Jesus Christ. Do you think that that's good works? Do you think that those good works, that he is being the servants for Jesus' sake, those good works are being that light shining forth through his life? So there's your two really good examples. Preach Jesus Christ and be a servant to others. And then there in verse 6, it says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts. This is why he's doing it. Why he's preaching Jesus Christ and why he's being that servant to others is because God has commanded it so that we would shine forth those lights. You know, this will help others establish faith before they come to know God. If you think about that, it's often said that you may be the only Bible that someone reads. You know, it's a shame that but that is actually true. Sometimes you're the only Bible that they read, and what they mean by that is they're going to look at your conversation of life, they're going to look at your actions, and how you act is how they associate Christianity. If that's with good works, if that's following after good things and shining the light so that they will glorify God, that's one thing. Another thing is if you call yourself a Christian but you don't do good works, you're living in that world of sin, that is how other people are, are relating Christianity to your actions in your life. They may never pick up the Bible and read it. Now hopefully the goal is that that may just be a starting point, that they will look at your life, and that they will see how you live and how you treat others and how you glorify God through your actions. And that will encourage them then to pick up God's word and read it. We don't want that to be the ending point. We want that to be a starting point. But if the starting point is they see you living a life full of sin and you're saying they're, you're a Christian, then what's the difference in what they're doing today? Why would they do anything different? So the point is when we shine the good works and we shine that light out of our life, that it can lead the lost souls to Christ. So with that, since we want to be that attractive light, we need to be optimistic. We need to have hope. We need to show these good things in our life. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16. It says, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you and every good word and work. You know, when we think about we need to be of a good cheer. You know, there's a lot of times we may rock, walk around, there's Christians that walk around all the time with their head down, just kind of moping, and they're not really attractive, are they? Are you attracted to people like that? Are you attracted to people who are always negative and down or complaining or whining about everything? Or are you attracted to people who are positive and uplifting and they encourage others and they do the things that they're supposed to do? And here's why. They do that because they know that God loves them. Right there in verse 16. It says that God our Father has loved us and has given us an everlasting consolation. That we know that we have that everlasting life with Him in heaven. 
and has given us that good hope through grace, the grace of Jesus Christ. He comforts our hearts, and He establishes us as every good word and work. If you truly know that, you truly believe that, then what's there to be sad about? What's there to be down about? Let's show forth this love. Let's show forth these good things as that positive life to others. Now, don't get me wrong. I know that we get beat down just like everyone else. I know we have hard times. I know Christians face persecutions. They face sufferings just like everyone else does. And it's not of, of just completely ignoring them and not recognizing that we have hard times too, but it's how you respond to those that what really matters. It's how you handle that so well. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 4 again. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 8, it says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Paul is writing to the Corinthians here, and he's saying we have hard times too. But we can face those hard times much stronger and much better than the world can because we have this hope, we have this love, and we have this consolation through Jesus Christ. There in verse 10, it says, Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. We always remember what Jesus did for us, that he died for us on the cross for our sins. So we have that grace, we have that hope. And since we know that, then we also have the light of Jesus might be made manifest in our body, or the good works would shine forth through us so that other people would see not just that he died, but also that he was resurrected and that he defeated death. We have the opportunity to defeat death as well. And we show forth that hope through the good works in our life and that light. So the point is, don't, don't always walk around with a sad countenance and always looking down and having all these things going against you, but instead show forth the hope and the praises of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. Now, the third thing I want to look at is some really applicable ways of how to reveal Christ in your life. How can we make sure that Christ is being shown forth through our actions? Well, the first thing I want to look at is an example that we have in 1 Samuel, and that's with David. What we're going to read in here is a lot of boldness and courage from David when he was facing Goliath. Now, we all know this story when David went out to Goliath, but to kind of give you a little bit of a backdrop, David was a young man. He was the youngest of all his brothers out of the household of Jesse. Jesse was his father. Now, David was out there, and David was the keeper of the sheep, but all of his brothers who were older and bigger and much stronger than him, they were all in the Israelite army, and they were all out fighting against the Philistine armies. So they were going out against there, and when the, the Philistine army came against the Israelite army, the Philistines, the bad guys, they sent one guy out who was their champion named Goliath of Gath. And this one guy was the biggest that they had ever seen. Now, keep in mind, the Philistines were all pretty big. But this guy was bigger than all the rest of them. He was going out, and he, his name was Goliath, and he went out in, in the middle. You had the Philistines on one side, the Israelites on the other side. Goliath comes out, and every day for 40 days and 40 nights, Goliath goes out and says, send you your best man out to fight me. If I win, your whole army will serve us. But if you win, our whole army will serve you. That was the challenge. Instead of an army versus army, we're going to have a one-on-one. -on -one. You bring out your best and see who can defeat me. Now think about this. The Israelite army was God's army. They knew they had God on their side, but there was not a single one of them that was going to go out against Goliath. Nobody. For 40 days, they had to listen to this guy mock their army and mock God, and they would not go out and go battle him. Not a single person, including the king Saul. Now, when you read a little bit about King Saul, he was the first king of Israel, and it says that he stood head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. He was a big guy. He was what you would want a king to look like. He was this man of war. He was going to go out. He was going to lead, lead everybody, take charge. But here's the kicker. He ain't going out against Goliath either. Nobody was. They were scared to death of this guy. And then you have this lowly old shepherd boy that's taking care of the sheep, and he's coming out just to check on his brothers. His dad sent him to check on his brothers, to take him food and water and make sure that they're okay. So he's going out just to check on his brothers. He's assuming that God's army is defeating the other army, because that's what they're supposed to do. And he goes and he sees all the Israelite army just sitting over trembling, 
Because this one guy is calling them out. Nobody's doing anything about it. So that's when we have David come to the scene. Let's read about that in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32. 1 Samuel 17 and 32, it says, And David said to Saul, the king, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both this lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Now let's back up just a little bit from what I read. David comes to the Israelite army, and he says, When he was taking care of sheep, there came a lion and a bear, and David killed it with his bare hands. I don't know if you've ever seen a lion or a bear, but I have absolutely no interest in trying to kill this thing with my bare hands, much less a long-range rifle. That's close enough. And David goes out and kills this thing with his bare hands, and he's telling the king Saul of the Israelite army, I'm going to go kill this Philistine just like I did those things. Now think about the courage and the boldness that David had when he goes out to do this. And he's talking to the king Saul, who's the first king of Israel. Now remember, what happens if David loses? Then all of the Israelites have to submit to all the Philistines. Remember, that's the challenge. What happens if David wins? All the Philistines have to submit to all the Israelites. This is a big gamble. But he says it in such a way with his courage and with his confidence that, that the Lord is going to deliver him, that the king says, okay, go kill him. And that's exactly what he did. So now we have this strength. You can read from one of the Psalms, Psalms chapter 27, verse 1 and 3. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Can you hear the confidence coming from David? Can you see that his confidence is actually coming from God and the Lord, not anything of his own? It's not his own strength. It's not his own doing that he knows he's going to defeat Goliath, but it's coming from the Lord. He knows that, he, that God is with him. Now let's, let's keep going. In 1 Samuel 17, we're going to skip down to 45. Then said David to the Philistine. Okay, let's think about that. Now David goes out. Before, what had happened is Saul tried to put Saul's armor on David. Now remember, Saul's a really big guy. David's kind of a little guy. When you do a little bit of studying about David, it's said that he was probably roughly 5'6 to 5'8. He's kind of a little guy. Now Saul was a very big guy. He stood head and shoulders above everybody else. And Saul goes on to put his armor upon David, and David can't wear it. He can't do anything with it. So he sheds it all off. He doesn't have anything except for a sling and a stone, and he goes out to fight against this Goliath. It says, He goes and says to the Philistine, Goliath, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Now look at this again. David goes out to Goliath and says, Goliath, you're coming to me with all this weaponry. You've got a sword and a spear and a shield. You have all these things. And in fact, Goliath had a guy with him carrying his, his sword, his armor bearer. So he goes with all these physical weapons and all this equipment. And David says, you come to me with all these things, and I come to you against the Lord of the host. You sure you still want to fight me? That's what David's saying. Are you sure you still want to go against the, the Lord of hosts? Let's continue on in verse uh, 46. It says, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So David's recapping again, saying, You're coming to me with all this equipment, and I'm coming to you with, with God. 
and God is going to deliver you in my hands. I'm not only going to kill you, I'm going to chop off your head, and I'm going to give your body to the fowls of the air and the wild beasts of the field, and not to you only, but to all the Philistines. Right there it says, the host of all the Philistines this day. I'm going to kill you all because God is with me. And that's exactly what happened. He goes out there, he slings one stone, it nails him right in the forehead. It says it hit him so hard that it sunk into his forehead. Then he fell. And then David goes out and he doesn't have a way to chop off his head because he didn't have a sword. So he takes Goliath's sword. He takes his own sword from him and chops off his own head. Then what do you think happened with the Philistine army when they saw their champion fall? They took off. They started running for the hills. What happened to the Israelite army? They gained their courage back. They realize that God is with us. They have that confidence. So now the Israelite army, they start chasing all the Philistines, and they chase them all the way, and they kill them all, just as David said. The point is this. David got his courage and confidence from God, and he used that to shine forth that light in his actions to go against the Philistine Goliath. And when he did, and he succeeded, he used that courage and confidence. What did that do with everybody else around him? that immediately sparked their courage and confidence in the Lord as well. So when we think about our life, one applicable way of how we reveal Christ in our life is to show courage, to show confidence. Now let's think about it in today's term. Are you ever going to go up in a battle against a Philistine giant? Probably not. But what are some things that we face today? In Christianity, sometimes the things that we do may or may not be the most comfortable things. Let's say you have to have a hard discussion with someone who's not living right. Let's say you need to have Bible studies. You know, need to go preach to the lost. You need to go do these things and, and step outside of your comfort zone. They're not the most comfortable. But the point is, you get your courage and confidence, not from yourself, but you get your courage and confidence from, from God. And God is the one who's going to lead you through these things. So how are you ever going to know how much you can truly do and how much light you can truly show for God and for His kingdom if you don't expand your self-limitations? Step outside your comfort zone and just do it anyways and let God help you. Now the second thing I want to look at after courage and confidence is how we appear, how we show forth ourselves. So we talked a little bit earlier about not having a sad countenance, not walking around, moping all the time. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. It says, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head, and wash thy face. What Jesus is writing here is don't go around looking like you're all sad and you're all moping, you got all these things. Wash your face, get up, and be a positive light to the world. Even when you're fasting, even when you have hard times in your life, you have these things going on. Now, typically what would happen is when you have people fasting, it's because they were facing something really challenging in their life. Something happened to them, and they needed to get back to God, and they needed to just self-reflect for a while, so that's when they would fast. So he's saying you don't go around them and disfigure their faces like the hypocrites, but wash your face, get up, anoint your head. So your appearance does matter. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 7, in way it says, Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garments be always white, let thy head lack no ointment. So take care of yourself. Make sure that you're showing forth that, those praises of God, because God is accepting your works. So when we shine forth a light, let it be a positive light. Let it be an uplifting light and encouraging to others. Now, another uh, aspect of how, we, how our appearance is, is how we dress. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, let's read verse 9 and 10. It says, In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now what it's talking about, I know this is specifically addressing women to adorn themselves in modest ways, but this applies to all of us, to dress modestly. Now when we think about dress modestly, it's not just the certain cuts of your fabric that may be too revealing. It could also be the tightness or loose, looseness of your clothing, clothing 
It may be the things that your clothing says. It may be certain brands. It may be certain phrases on your clothing. It may be certain things that are attracting eyes to look in inappropriate ways. So when we think about modest clothing, we need to be thinking about all these things. That making sure that they're in verse 10, that we're professing ourselves even in the way we dress, with good works. That we're showing the Christ in our life, we're showing that light out of our life with how we dress and how we show forth ourselves to the world. The third thing I want to look at is our speech. Making sure that we're revealing Christ in our life with how we talk in our speech. Psalms chapter 34 verse 13 says, Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Now when you look at that, the lips from speaking guile, a lot of times we may associate that with certain words that are not appropriate words, cuss words. But that's talking more than just about cuss words. Speaking guile means speaking filthy, Speak, speaking things that are not appropriate to say. That could be talking bad about your brothers or sisters. It could be gossiping around other people. It could be talking down about anything or just speaking in a way that is not appropriate to speak. So a good question to ask you, is if Christ was to listen to all of your conversations over the last week, what would he say? Would he be happy with those conversations you had? Would he be pleased with that? Would he see that you're showing forth his light out of your speech? Or would he be ashamed? Would he rebuke you? Would he say that you need to change the way you talk and you need to change your actions? In James chapter 1, verse 26, it says, If any man among you seem to be religious... And bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is in vain. When you look up that word vain, it just means emptiness. It means fruitless, that it's pointless. Now, if you think yourself to be religious, but you can't keep control of your own tongue, you can't just talk about good things and honest things and pure things, you first off, you're deceiving your own heart, and your religion is in vain. Your religion doesn't matter if you can't keep control of your own tongue. James chapter 5, verse 12, it says, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest you fall into condemnation. What it's telling us here is make sure that we're both speaking and living with integrity. Back up what you say. Whatever you say you're going to do, do it. Whatever you say you're not going to do, don't do it. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, so you don't fall into condemnation. So now the fourth thing I want to look at is your daily conduct of life, or your conversation of life. Psalms chapter 34, verse 14, it says, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. That's easy to understand. Back in Deuteronomy, God wrote to us and he says, I set before you both life and death. Choose life so that you can follow after that. What it's telling us here is you have evil and you have good. Depart from evil, go to good. Seek peace and pursue it. Very simple to understand. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 27, it says, He that diligently seeketh good procureth favor, but he that seeketh mischief, it shall come unto him. Once again, these are easy to understand. Now, it's easy to understand. It may be a little bit harder to do sometimes. That's why it tells us in verse 27 right there, that you diligently seek good. This is all the time. It's given your best efforts that you're following after good and you will procure favor. If you seek trouble, you're going to find that too. So you've got the choice of what you want to do. Now, this good conduct that we have, this can persuade non-believers. We have an example of that in the First Testament. First Peter chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. It says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Now I know this is specifically talking to a wife and being in subjection to her husband, but this also applies to all of us as well. So if you think about that, right there in verse 1 it says, If any obey not the word, think about people in your life. Is there anybody in your life has, that has obeyed not the word of God? They haven't been baptized into Christ. They're not showing forth the, the good works in their life that they should. Is there anybody in your life you can think about that? All of us have somebody. Now it says right there that they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives or by your conversation. So if they're not going to pick up the Bible and read God's word, 
They're going to look at you and your conversation of life. We talked about this earlier, about shining forth the light out of Christ. If you're calling yourself a Christian, but you're not having a good conversation of life, you're not walking that daily walk, why in the world would they see any need to change? But instead, if you're calling yourself a Christian and you're showing forth Christ in your life, you're showing forth that light in your actions of how you live for God and how you serve others and you're doing it the best you can all the time, that is what will get them to change. It will get them to look at it and say, he's different. Something's going on with him, and I want to find out what it is. It says that they will be won by the conversation, how you live your life. So it does matter. It matters how you live and how you show forth the praises of God. You know, when, we, when you were baptized and you became a Christian, you do realize that you put on Christ, as it talks about in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. It says, For many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So we know that when we're baptized into Christ, that is when we're called out of the world. That is when we leave that old man of sin and the watery graves of baptism. We rise up a new creature into Christ. We're called into the church. We're now a Christian and a disciple of Christ, and we're baptized in the Christ, and we have put on Christ. Now I want you to think about putting on something. If you think about you put on a coat or you put on a cloak, what does that mean? That means you show it. That means it is there for people to see. You put it on. It is in your life. You've been baptized into Christ. You've put on Christ. You show forth the praises of Christ. You've been clothed with salvation and with righteousness, as it talks about in Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 10, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. When you think about the bridegroom with his ornaments or the bride with her jewels, think about that when, when two people are going to get married. They put on their best, don't they? They look the very best that they can so that other people can see it. This is what it's talking about in Isaiah. It gives us this relation that when we are baptized into Christ, that he clothes us with the garments of salvation and he covers us with the robes of righteousness. Show forth your best because Christ is giving you his best. He's putting it on your life. And we should show forth the praises of him who has called us. So the question is, are you showing forth this righteousness and this salvation in your life today? We've now been taught that we should reveal Christ in our life. We've shown you some very applicable ways of how to do that. And there's many other ways that you can do that. We've only touched on a few. Are you revealing Christ in your life through your actions? Are you showing forth that light in your life so that other people would come to God? They would see your good works and they would glorify your God and your Father. Are they seeing those actions? Are you allowing your life to reveal glory and the love of Jesus through your actions? Or are you squandering it away? We hope you enjoyed this teaching from God's Word. To receive new sermons each week, subscribe on Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, and like us on Facebook. Thanks for listening, and God bless.